in one of the remotest regions of Africa, the far southwest of Ethiopia, along the River Omo, live a people called the Kwegu. A shot to scare off a crocodile. The man who fired the shot is a visitor here. He's been asked to come and help solve a problem. A rifle has been lost in the river, and the visitor has special skills which may help to retrieve it. His name is Darchu, and he's a Kwegu. Like the rest of the Kwegu, Darchu has lived beside this river all his life. He's expert on the river. The man who lost the rifle is a member of another group, the Mursi. Most of the Mursi are uneasy on the dangerous water. But for all their superior river skills, Kwegu like Darchu are dominated by the Mursi. This film is about that relationship between the dominators and the dominated, and about a system which makes the Kwegu second class people in Morsi society. <laughs> But for all Darchu's efforts, it's a hopeless search. The Morsi rifle stays lost in the river. Africa's great rivers, flowing for 2,000 miles from the center of Ethiopia. In the far southwest, it runs through some of the most isolated regions on the continent. This is the territory of the Mursi and the Kwegu. There are around 5,000 of the cattle herding Mursi, moving between the river and the plains. But the Kwegu, who live permanently along the river, number less than 500. It's the dry season now, and the river is low, uncovering island cultivation sites like Alaka. Alaka is home for Darchu and two dozen other Kwegu. It's also an important cultivation area for around 200 Mursi. Over a period of more than 10 years, anthropologist David Turton has lived and worked among the Mursi and the Kwegu. The Kwegu see themselves as different from the Mursi and vice versa. And yet they are also so closely intertwined that it's not really possible to think of them as separate tribes or ethnic groups. It is at this time, at the height of the dry season, between about November and February, that the Morsi and Kwegu come into closest contact because they are actually living and cultivating together at the same places along the Omo. This place, Alaka, which is on the West Bank, is definitely regarded as Kwegu country in the fullest sense of the word. They have a connection with it which precedes, in their eyes, the arrival of the Mursi. Yeah. 
Early morning at Darchu's settlement. Even the layout of the houses tells something about the relationship between the dominant Mursi and Kwegu like Darchu. His house is one of six Kwegu houses which are grouped in a circle at one end of a string of Mursi houses. And the six Kwegu houses face inwards and therefore they form a clearly separate unit within the larger settlement. And this nicely shows that the Kwegu are, as it were, separate, they hold themselves apart, or they are held apart by the Morsi, and yet they are so closely involved with the Morsi that they are part of the same society. Kwegu, like Darchu, are very much aware of their separate identity. They have their own language, though they're also bilingual in Morsi. The Morsi themselves claim that Kwegu is virtually impossible to learn. One important question that arises is, how are the two groups held together? How have the Morsi managed to incorporate the Kwegu so effectively into their society while at the same time keeping them, as it were, socially at arm's length and in a lower social position? What are the means of Morsi domination? For Darchu and the Kwegu, there is one inescapable answer to that question, the Morsi cattle. Morsi cattle come to drink at the river. It's only at the height of the dry season when the river is at its lowest and the tsetse fly aren't a danger to the cattle that the Morsi bring their herds in from the plains 20 miles away to the Omo. It's also a time when cattle raiders are most threatening and the river offers security to the treasured herds. I think it's interesting that the Morsi normally describe the Kwegu negatively. They say what they're not, not what they are. And the main thing that the Kwegu are not is cattle herders. So the Morsi normally describe the Kwegu as people who have no cattle. And it's this lack of cattle that justifies, in the eyes of the Morsi, the low social status of the Kwegu. For the Morsi, the cattle are not so much food as wealth. They're also the principal means of the Morsi domination over the Kwegu. Through their monopoly of cattle, the Morsi control the continuation of life itself for the Kwegu. A Kwegu cannot marry without the assistance of a Morsi, because in order to marry another Kwegu, a Kwegu has to hand over livestock. The Kwegu, of course, don't have cattle, therefore, in order to obtain the cow or the bull, which they need in order to obtain the goats, which they need in order to marry, they require the services of a Morsi. In this way, the Morsi have managed to control, as it were, the means of Kwegu reproduction. They have brought about a situation in which the very reproduction of the Kwegu, their continued existence, depends upon the Morsi, and there could be no more real dependence than this. The Kwegu, like the Morsi, are polygamous, and Darchu has two wives. At their cultivation site, Darchu's family have an important visitor. Komarakora is a Morsi priest. He's also Darchu's patron, the man who provided cattle for both his marriages. Once a particular Morsi has handed over such an animal to a particular Kwegu for the purposes of marriage, that Morsi becomes especially intimately involved, not just with that Kwegu himself, but also with his children. And this relationship continues through the generations. <laughs> Now, 
Nabamu is the wife of Darchu's brother, Kumali. Like every Kwegu wife, she was married with the intervention of her husband's Morsi patron. Kumali's patron is another important Morsi, Biyui Tongia. <laughs> In the end, it's the threat of force which keeps the Kwegu in their place. It's the threat of force which ultimately sanctions this relationship. It's the threat of force which lies behind the acceptance by the Kwegu of what appears to us to be a disadvantageous position. Although they will never actually say, and they presumably do not feel that they are being exploited. Like most Kwegu, Kumali is an expert with canoes. The river is quiet at this time of year, but in the flood season his skill will be fully tested. Kumali made this canoe himself, and it's an important contribution to his relationship with his Morsi patron. That relationship is essentially an exchange of services. For the Morsi, no Kwegu service is more important than their skill with canoes on the River Omo. The majority of the Morsi are not at home in canoes, and especially during the height of the flood, or around about September, virtually no Morsi is able to take that canoe across the river. Now, the Morsi need to get across the river then because at least 50% of their Omo cultivation is on the west bank and, of course, the Morsi keep their cattle on the east bank. So, the problem is that they have to get across the river when the river is still very high in order to take advantage of the moisture that has been left in the soil by the receding flood. This means that they need canoes and they need people who are capable of taking them across the river at this particularly dangerous time. The river is running very fast indeed, and anyone who falls into it, however strong he is as a swimmer, is almost certain to be snapped up by a crocodile. There is a very high population of crocodiles, of man-eating crocodiles in the river. So it's a dangerous business for anyone who is not thoroughly expert. <laughs> the fact that Kwegu like Darchu and Kumali live permanently at the river means that they're always available to look after the canoes and the Morsi can be sure that the Kwegu will be there to ferry them across when they come to the Omo to cultivate. As the time approaches, Darchu is told by his Morsi to be ready with the canoe. <laughs> Eh, <laughs>
In the riverside forest at Alaka, Darchu has found a bee's nest. He begins the process of smoking out. Gathering honey is another valued Kwegu service. In the establishment of a relationship between a particular Kwegu and a particular Morsi, honey very often plays an important part. There are many ways in which honey can be used by the Mursi. Honey is an item which is much in demand among Highland Ethiopians. It is used in the making of what might be called the national drink of Ethiopia, Tej. And any Mursi going into a Highland market town with honey to sell is sure of finding a buyer. It's highly marketable. In the highland villages, several days walk away in the mountains behind Alaka, the Mursi can use honey to trade for such valuable items as axes, knives, cloth, and even goats. Kwegu are in demand because of these services they provide, and there are not enough of them to go round. So they are in a position to pick and choose their patron. They're certainly not in a position to choose whether or not to have a patron, but they are in a position, to some extent, to choose whom they will accept as a patron. Uli Levi is a Morsi who's on the lookout for a Kwegu client. Itirna, Ituno, Midinaki Bagun, La Matamia Blitu, King Dada, Monabe, Utuna, look on me. Ulidivai's Quegu has moved north and found a patron among a neighboring group, the Bodhi. Ukana Bunga to Angi Tumur, Tamarayobu, Tamarabu. But Ulilibai has his eye on another possible Kwegu client. Close to the river, a work team begins to clear a new cultivation site. When the Omo floods the area, it will be a valuable new resource for the Morsi owner of the site. Because of the unpredictability of the environment, especially where rain is concerned, the Morsi have to rely on a number of different subsistence activities, flood cultivation, rain cultivation, cattle herding, fishing and some hunting and gathering. Through his possession of a Kwegu client, a Morsi has access to additional economic resources. And the fact that he can rely on his Kwegu to ferry him across the river means that the Morsi patron gets added status and power in relation to other Morsi. He's in a position to organize the important river crossing as the flood recedes, without which the Morsi could not cultivate on the West Bank. So it isn't an accident that those Morsi who have Kwegu clients turn out to be particularly important and influential in their own communities. A 
Amursi has brought his rifle to be repaired by Darchu. <laughs> The rifles left behind in Ethiopia by Italian occupying troops in the 1930s and sold by Highland traders are important to the Mursi in defending their cattle against raiders. The Kwegu are known as people who can use their hands in such jobs as metalwork. They still make fishing harpoons, and in the past they were able to make spearheads. They have a tradition of metalwork, in other words, and this has been carried over into looking after and repairing and generally servicing rifles. In a clearing near the river, a few miles south of Alaka, a new Kwegu canoe is under construction. The man in charge is Choya, Darchu's father-in-law. He's making the canoe for another Kwegu. <laughs>
Under the great shade tree at Alaka, the Morsi young men and girls gather for a daytime dance. The boys have just arrived from herding cattle back in the plains beyond the Omo. It's almost harvest time now, one of the few occasions in the year when cattle are brought close to the cultivation sites and Morsi men and women get together. Kwegu men like Darchu are free to join in the dance, but they're well aware of the limits set on their relationships with Morsi women. There is a strict separation between Kwegu and Morsi in matters of sex, and inevitably, therefore, in marriage. It's accepted by the Morsi that many Morsi young men will sleep with Kwegu girls, although, as they put it, they will do so dari, secretly. If it's a Kwegu man with a Morsi girl and he's discovered, then he is liable to be beaten very severely. At a settlement a few miles south of Alaka, negotiations are about to begin for a Kwegu wedding. The vital business of this morning is to settle the amount of bride wealth to be paid to the bride's father for his daughter. Neither the bride nor the groom are here in person, but relatives from miles around are gathering for the negotiations. Most of them can expect a share in the bride wealth, so they have a keen interest in what's about to happen. The patron of the absent groom has come here to negotiate with the bride's father. He's a Bodhi, since the Kwegu groom lives some miles north of here, in Bodhi territory. The Kwegu have the same patron-client relationship with the Bodhi as they do with the Morsi. And this morning, the groom's Bodhi patron has come south to negotiate on behalf of his Kwegu client. Like all patrons, he speaks as though he were about to marry the bride himself. <laughs> The bride's father immediately raises a major difficulty. His daughter has already had a child by the groom before any bride wealth had been handed over. He asks to see what the groom's patron has to offer before proceeding with the negotiation. The patron begins to lay out his initial offer in the form of bullets. Bullets are acceptable as bride wealth because they are a kind of small change. Five bullets are regarded as the equivalent of one goat. In Kwegu marriage, bullets are acceptable because they stand for goats. The groom's patron lays out 20 bullets as his initial offer, but there are more to come from another source. This man is an uncle of the bride who was given these bullets a few days earlier on condition that he would bring them to the negotiations and, so to speak, publicly display them as part of the bride wealth. I suppose this man had got in early with his claim because it's very much a matter of first come, first served in the distribution of bride wealth. It is not by any means all, as they say, eaten by the bride's father. 
The bride's father very often ends up with very little of the wealth that's been handed over because he is besieged by relatives who have the right to share in this bride wealth. The groom's patron now tries to smooth over the problem and lists other items of bride wealth already handed out. They include several goats and a rifle. But the bride's father complains that the rifle was damaged. His Morsi patron raises their demand dramatically in rejecting the 40 bullets currently on offer. <laughs> The bride's father and other people on the bride's side have in mind the fact that the groom is known to have in his possession a large number of bullets, even up to 200. It's very difficult, of course, to keep such things secret in a society like this, in a face-to-face -face society where everybody knows everybody else's business. The groom's patron doesn't attempt to deny that the extra bullets exist, but he's anxious to compromise. <coughs> As the morning sun heats up, the negotiators are becoming impatient. Complex calculations on both sides begin to refine the deal. The bride's father asks for a further 38 goats. The groom's patron offers 28. Then the 40 bullets become 80. Meanwhile, the heat of the day increases. <laughs> At last, the groom's uncle makes the vital concession. The negotiations are over. 60 bullets are to be added to the initial offer of 40. The total of 100 bullets is acceptable to the bride's father. But the most important Kwegu here, the bride's grandfather, Doki, still has to make the final speech. Both sides drink coffee to seal the agreement, but behind the hard bargaining, there's another story known only to the main negotiators. 
this was in fact a public performance, as all bride wealth negotiations of this kind are. What we have here is a public formal discussion which has been preceded by a detailed agreement which was worked out the night before in private between the groom's representatives and the bride's father. In fact, the situation is as follows. The groom's patron brought 100 bullets, but it was agreed that at the public negotiations he would only hand over 40, 60 having been kept back by the bride's father. It was agreed, in other words, that publicly it would be presented as a tough negotiation in which 60 further bullets were having to be handed over against their will by the groom's side. The reason was to help the bride's father withstand the demands of people who had a right to share in the bride wealth. He could say later on that by the time the bullets got down to him, so-and-so had had some of them and somebody else had had some of them, and all that he eventually received was a small number. It's a way of allowing the bride's father to evade demands in a way which does not alienate the person making the demand. At Darchu's cultivation site, his family gathers to eat at the end of the day. As with all Kwegu marriages, Darchu's was essentially a deal between two patrons and his father-in-law's patron would have taken a sizable number of the bride wealth goats. Since they don't keep domestic animals, it's hard to see why the Kwegu should use them in bride wealth. They have a tradition of marrying in the past without making use of domestic animals. And if one asks them, why do you use animals now? They say, it's because the Morsi insist on it. It's felt as a very real dependency by the Kwegu. If one asks them, what do the Morsi give you? The answer is always cattle, by means of which we marry. And the thought of marrying without cattle, or rather goats, since cattle are always converted into goats, is unthinkable for the Kwegu. Although they will admit that ultimately, the reason they do it is because the Morsi insist on it. <laughs> Darchu clears his new cultivation site close to the Omo. When the next wet season comes, the site will provide vital food for his family. Without a patron, a Kwegu like Darchu would be at risk of losing valuable resources like a cultivation area to the dominant Morsi. But with the protection of his Morsi patron, Darchu feels secure. There is a concept of a good patron a bad patron, a good Morsi and a bad Morsi. The Kwegu will describe the qualities of a good Morsi, a Morsi who looks after the interests of his Kwegu, who is prepared to stand up for his Kwegu against other Morsi, who steps in to protect him from the exploitation of other Morsi. Darchu has an alarming vision of how his life might be without the protection of his Morsi patron. <laughs> Kumali shares Darchu's alarm about the unthinkable prospect of life as a Kwegu without the protection of a Morsi patron. <laughs>
Under the shade tree at Alaka, Darchu plays a game of Huroi with a group of Morsi. Despite the Kwegu vision of Morsi violence without their patron's protection, it's apparent that on a daily basis, Kwegu and Morsi remain at ease with one another. And it's clear that the Kwegu are content with their lower status. They accept the fact that the Morsi are the dominant partners in the relationship and they do not appear to resent it. One has to come to the conclusion, as an outside observer, that the Morsi are getting more out of it than the Kwegu. So one might therefore be led to ask, well, why do not the Kwegu realize this? Why do they not uh, at least, even if they're powerless to do anything about it, why do they not at least recognize the fact? The answer to that is that the Kwegu see the matter differently. They do not see themselves as getting less out of the relationship than the Morsi. On the contrary, they see what they provide as being relatively trivial. If one asks a Kwegu, on the other hand, what would you do without the Morsi? They say, we wouldn't be able to marry, we wouldn't be able to reproduce, we wouldn't be able to have any children. <laughs> they see the Morsi as essential to their continued existence. <laughs> Close to a fresh track, Darchu prepares to set a trap for a small antelope. It's a skill his ancestors have employed for thousands of years. But although traditional Kwegu skills survive, their relationship with the Morsi is changing. We must realize, of course, that this is not a static relationship. And one of the most important things to understand is that it is changing. And we have a lot of evidence that the relationship between the two groups was more distant, more separate in the past than it is now. Over the past generation, and possibly even over the past 10 years, there has taken place a more evident merging of the two groups. And as the people themselves say, this is probably related to the very small numbers of the Kwegu. It is consistently stated that the Kwegu are diminishing in numbers. <laughs>
Both the Kwegu and the Morsi agree that the Kwegu are losing their identity and being absorbed into Morsi society. Within memory, Kwegu were even barred from visiting the Morsi cattle. But today, taboos against the Kwegu are fading. And despite strong disapproval, marriage between Morsi and Kwegu is now admitted to occur. <laughs> The new Kwegu canoe is ready for launching. <laughs> Although the owner and the builder are Kwegu, most of the people here are Morsi. And as their population dwindles, the Kwegu take their place as second-class people inside Morsi society. Kwegu cannot imagine life without the Morsi. So despite the very important services they provide for the Morsi, they see themselves as gaining most from the relationship. It's a pattern that may help to explain how, in other societies, dominated groups have come to accept their unequal position. So it may tell us something about the way social inequalities become accepted as part of the natural order. I'm <laughs> sorry. 